Do you realize that in a few days we will be celebrating in America the second most favored and certainly most commercialized holiday in America behind Christmas, and that is Halloween. Did you know that? Right now, it is increasingly pushing toward uh, the merchandise and the money that is spent at Christmas. Americans are making Halloween one of the most commercialized events in our national calendar. And you will notice, you can go to a hospital, you can go to uh, the principal's office, you can go just about anywhere, and you will see uh, you know, cobwebs, and you will see skeletons, you'll see ghosts, or you know, a head lopped off, or a jack-o'-lantern. I was driving into the community where we live, and I noticed over every archway, going in and coming out, they have little ghosts over each one of them. And I guarantee you, because I plan to make a visit to the, the CMA probably Tuesday, because I don't think they're open on Monday, and I'm going to ask them, why do you think I want to drive under a ghost every time I come in to my community? But I guarantee you, if anyone has even said anything, I'd be surprised. If they did, I guarantee you, it would be less than a handful. But you put a Bible or anything associated with it. And I'm just talking about, certainly, uh, if they put a Bible up there, there'd be an uprising. But you can't even let a valedictorian who is the speaker at commencement of graduation mention the name of Jesus. If they mention the name of Jesus, that is completely taboo. For you to suggest the name of Jesus, you can say any other deity you want. Name them, you can say it, and nobody will even blink. But the moment you mention the name of Jesus, you talk about a reaction. It is absolutely unbelievable. Do you know, I think it was two years ago, and it was somewhere in, in the South, which I was surprised by. But they were having a graduation in, at one of the churches. And before they, because they, the gymnasium or their auditorium at the public high school couldn't, uh, they couldn't house all the people who wanted to come. So they had used this uh, auditorium of a church before. Do you know the atheist? put up such a fight over the cross and anything Christian that they made them cover it. And because there was a cross in the front where they would normally walk in, they made them, the graduates, come through a side door where they could have a covering so they wouldn't see anything that had a Christian application uh, or implication to it. And when they went in, they had dark curtains over the cross and anything that would speak of Christ. Folks, we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against wickedness in, t in high places. Now listen, last week I spoke out of Ephesians. Let me just share this with you. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, the eyes, I pray that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Yes. Who's calling? The calling of God for your life. Amen. That is my prayer that the eyes, not your heart. He doesn't say, I pray that the heart of your understanding is enlightened because the heart you cannot trust. Amen. Some of you right now are already saying, you know, I've got a decision to make and I just cannot trust anyone else but my heart. And I just read in Jeremiah where it says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? 
So Paul says, I pray the eyes of your understanding being enlightened or that they would be uh, of understanding, open, that you might know what is the hope of his calling. Do you know, and I said this last week, do you know every day, every week we should have the excitement of, I don't know what God has planned for me this week, but the hope of his calling in my life is so great, I'm excited because I know something good is gonna happen to me this week. That is the hope of my calling. That is the hope of my prayer calling. That is the hope of my worship calling. That is the hope of my fellowship calling. Excitement, expectation, supernatural, knowing that God has something planned that I don't even know about, but it's exciting, it's expecting, it's edifying. Hallelujah. And that is my prayer for you. And that you would know what the riches of the glory of his inheritance are in the saints. Do you know what the riches of his inheritance to you is as a saint of God? Folks, there's no limit. Why is it that we feel that our God can only do so much? When we hear cancer or heart disease or a a tumor, oh my goodness. I hope there's somebody there to comfort them. And I do too. But folks, we have a God who's greater than just someone to comfort us in bad times. He is the God of the impossible who can heal every sickness, every disease, and every disease was placed upon his back at Calvary. And by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. And what's more, he says in verse 19, and that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. He is saying, I pray that you grasp this. I pray every one of you today would get a hold of this and understand how exceedingly great far above all principalities upon every dominion over every other name and authority given, God has given to us that power that is greater than all of these principalities. According to his mighty power. Now that's a general statement. He is saying, I, I pray for you. And as pastor, I pray for you. Some of you right now, you're struggling with your business and you're saying, pastor, you don't know how bad it is. You know what? I don't have to know how bad it is. He knows. <laughs> but do you think for one moment, a loving God who has every plan of your life, the hairs of your head numbered, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, He clothes the lily in all of their beauty. Do you think that he doesn't know your situation and how he's going to prevail in your life so that you will overcome whatever obstacle you may face? God has already planned it for you. And he's saying he has given us this power that is over any other, every other power that is named. Which, this is the specific now, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That, beloved, is the seal of our victory. You say, how do I know I'm going to be victorious over the problems that I face? I'll tell you because there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem and there is a seated Lord and Savior who is, listen, who is seated in heavenly places, 
high above all power, all might, all dominion. There is no power greater than his power. And he's seated in it. He's not standing up, pacing the floor. He's not furrowing his brow. He's not biting his nails and saying, I don't know if we can overcome this one. The proof of it is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead shall also quicken you, shall also be your power over every temptation, every trial, every test, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have power over that. Is sickness a dominion? Yes. We have power over disease. We have power over hatred. We have power over terror. And yet we sit there as if we can't hardly stand up straight because we've just been beaten down. And I don't doubt the enemy hasn't attacked you, but listen to me. You have a greater power than the enemy has ever thought of. And and every demon in hell bristles when you speak the name of Jesus because that power is greater in authority and dominion and power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember the little girl in Philippi that was following the apostles, and she did, she followed them for three days, and she said, these are ministers of the Most High God who bring to us the way of salvation, which was a true statement. But you know what? Paul said, it's true, but I don't need you telling me that. I don't need some demon-possessed girl who knows that the power she has is limited and that the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than any dimension or any dominion or any power on this earth or heaven or principality. And he said, by the way, close your mouth, come out of her. We have that kind of power. And in these last days, church, listen to me. Satan is taking the mask off. We are are contending against principalities and powers. Let me just read to you, if I may, where it says in in, uh, 1 Timothy, if I may, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Notice who this is. Some shall depart from the faith. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. And folks, if the Lord shall tarry, I ask you, how many of you believe in five years that if the Lord tarries his return, You'll still be serving him. You say, yes, pastor, I am determined. The only way that we will live to overcome is to live every day in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. Do you hear me? You can't do it in your own power. That's why every day Paul says, I make mention of you in my prayers. Why? That your faith that has been heard of would grow in Christ Jesus and your love for each other. And yet you can't even stand to be in the same room with another Christian. Wow. And we ask God to meet our needs, that God would heal our bodies or heal our child or provide a work or or, uh, uh, finances for us and yet we have such hatred and unforgiveness in our heart toward another brother or sister? 
Do you think for one moment that the Lord hears your prayers? No. First John says this, First John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If you don't love your brother, you don't know God because God is love. And the Bible says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So don't tell me I can't love that man. You can't, but he can. And when the Spirit of God begins to move within us, He begins to produce a love that is supernatural, a love that is from another world, another dimension. It is the love of God that died for you on a cross. And we must love others. But it says, the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You mean to tell me, pastor, that's coming into the church? Folks, it's already in the church. It's already in the church. If you don't believe it, turn on Christian television. You'll get a mouthful right there. I'm not saying everybody on TV is not of God, but when I hear people, all they want to talk about are all of these celebrations Jewish celebrations where you need to send uh, $975 because that has some kind of prophetic implication. Let me tell you, if all they preach is money, then their God is money. The Bible says preach the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. I believe in prosperity. I believe God can bless you. I believe God can meet any financial need. But he's also concerned about our conversation, our walk in life, how we live among the lost, that we live like we do on Sunday, Monday through Saturday. Amen. Amen. That's not bad. One more scripture and I'm going to, I'm going to pray. Second Timothy chapter three. Look there with me. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. And look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now tell me something. With what we are witnessing on, uh, in the world. And listen, I, I got to tell you this. I was in... My, I was in the room with Beth. She had on uh, uh, one of the news stations. They were talking about all the, you know, the stuff that's going on, the election, and all of the, the, the suggestive blue language and, and, and all of that and, and how horrified you know, people are and, and they should be. But I walked into the kitchen And it was a main station. I don't know, ABC, CBS, one of them. And it was two men. And they were pushing a buggy. And one was the the man and one was the woman. And he was, the man was calling him, uh, oh, honey, and and sweetie, and and sugar. And and, uh, they started talking in a conversation that was so bad, I was horrified. I was horrified by it. And it is one of the most popular, if not the most popular programs on mainline stations. 
because I, I, I don't know. I saw the name and then I've heard it repeated and I asked. So as I went, oh yeah, that's one of the most popular programs on television. And they're talking about what they do in bed. And uh, folks, we are living in a modern day Sodom. We are living in a modern day Sodom. And if you think, and what did the Bible says? It says concerning Lot that Lot vexed his righteous soul with the sins of the people in Sodom. You know what happens after a while? We get, we get tired of coming up against it. We get tired of being the only one maybe to speak up in a class or to say something in our community. So what do we do? We just close our mouths and we just roll along with everybody else. We don't say anything to offend. We don't say anything to the boss about the conversation at the, you know, at the water pot or coffee break where men and women both gather and they talk about things that would make a man blush. Excuse me, a sailor blush. And we don't say anything. We don't say anything. And then we go back to our Bible, which we have to hide, bring it out, read a few verses and hope that nobody sees us and then slip it back in, when in reality, we ought to put it right on the top of the desk and read it and dare them. And dare them to say, you're questioning my reading the Word of God when they have been talking about stuff I could not even repeat to you in public? Yeah, yes. Come on, where do you get off telling me I can't read the Word of God? Yes. Read it anyway. Yes. Read it anyway. Hallelujah. If we get to that place, church, if we get to that place, they're going to come after Christians anyway, so you might as well get ready because if God is for us, who can be against us? Everyone stand to your feet right now. Hallelujah.